Hello, my lovelies. I just want to wish you all a very happy New Year's Eve. And as a little gift, I found a gem <laughs> to share with you guys tonight. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have seen this. I had not seen it. Um, this is a documentary type <laughs> film from the BBC back in 1974 featuring our very, very good lead singer of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, Mr. Vivian Stanchel. Yes, this is called Vivian Stanchel, One Man's Week. <laughs> and like I said, it's back from 1974 and the character sure as heck fire looks a lot like our good friend Bill. You guys be the judges. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, I just had to share this with you guys. So again, have a wonderful New Year's Eve and a wonderful start to your 2023. And I will see you guys next year. Bye. Oh, I feel glamorous. Oh, oh that uh, interesting little yellow stain there, if you're watching in colour, is in fact Vindaloo. I rushed wild-eyed out into the night and had a curry a few nights back. My word, I look saint-like in repose. Oh, there I was, peacefully snoozing, when a gang of roughs with cameras burst in and caught me nighty. Get up, the mirrors must be painted. The barking fish refuses to lie down. What's he been reading? Bed me. He was driving me crazy, but it didn't matter. She was in my blood. We had a ball until her husband got wise. He was also my boss. I knew I would have to pay, but I didn't know how much. 40p, apparently. None of us could resist her ripe young body. It was her first, but I wasn't her last. Disgusting, filthy beast. Oh, this week's been a teeny bit jollier. And the first occasion of any moment was on Monday, when I slid off to BBC's brainwashing house in London's seamy Portland Place. Past the provocative thrust of the zebra's butt, down, down we go to meet with a little trepidation, for the first time, the ferocious father of British broadcasting, Jack Domaniac. Welcome back to my second guest, Vivian Stanchel, who used to have a band called the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. And uh, he wants to have a few words with you on his own first, and uh, a little later on, I'll be talking to him. <laughs> I thought that was a cheese for quite a long time. Today, I'm concerned with gobbledygook, not scat singing, but genuine, honest rubbish. Perhaps the husband of the wife of Mr. Wu will put you in a more distracted state of mind. Said the geisha serving tea me like a you. A tasty dish you brought and made love to. Then I said you'd better stop, but you can't meddle with me chopstick. I'm the husband of the wife of Mr. Wu. Well, thank you, Vivian Stanshaw. Now, don't go away, because as I said, I want to know a little bit more about you. 
Tell me about the Bonzo Dog Doodah Bear and the Bonzo Dog cartoon character. Bonzo Dog was um, uh, a very hedonistic, um, drunken little fellow who was always looking up ladies' kilts and trying not to pay his tuppence on the deck chairs and so on, and was very good looking graphically. I mean, he turned up in loads and loads of postcards from 1922 to about 1941 and a half or something. Um, what we did as a band was simply to go to pubs, say, has anyone got any requests? And they say, yeah, can you play Release Me? And we say, <laughs> immediately, dear boy, and pretend to play whatever people ask for. Now, let's uh, forget you for a moment and then talk about your records. Where do you get all these marvellous records from? Well, in fact, places like this, here in the Old Kent Road, Goldie Oldies, and I'm hoping that I'll find in here some whelks as well as some records to brighten up the radio program. Hot hits is the two big reasons why I like you. Oh, whack a do whack a day. And I did E. I'm on this one. There I am. Bonzo Dog Band. Uh, the Blue Men Sing the Whites. I wrote that one. But what I'm really after is 78s. Where are they? Yes. Are <laughs> you? Rascals. <laughs> Right, this is what I'm really looking for. Jim Jam's The Duchess. I've got a record of The Duchess at home with piano. It'll be instrumental. I like that. The Cobbler's Song. Right, I think not, possibly. Um, I Could Be a Mountain by Jimmy Young. Sounds likely. Oh, this is, this is more the sort of thing that I'm looking for. Ridiculous titles. Po Key O Key O. Comedy Foxtrot. Original Havana Band. I don't know if that's. The Savoy Havana Band. If it was, I would buy it. I mean, all of this could be used I mean, in the radio. I mean, I, I imagine the ratio is um, one record in ten I can possibly use. I didn't really never ought to have went from Lights Up, Doris Hare Comedienne. I'll buy that, same as I will. Oh, yes, yeah, Sandy Powell. That's the sort of thing that. Um, I like Sandy Powell. Can you hear me, Mother? Hear my prayer, Master Kenneth Purves, the famous boy chorister. Over the wings of a dove. And I'll have that because I like the, the song and I like the idea of Mr. Purves or Master Purves. Oh. What your birth stars foretell if born in July. Great. People born in July are often looked upon as a puzzle by their relatives and friends. They are at once strong and weak, clever and stupid. For instance, they seem and actually are romantic souls. The women see their love affairs through a rose-colored haze. They sacrifice all for the one they love. Yet, a July sweetheart will inquire gently, but firmly, how much her suitor earns per week or per year. Again, July people have an itch to travel, but nobody is more fond than you. Now, I never know what a normal person is. But, Not uh, do I. <laughs> so, would you like to tell me? You said you don't, but uh, who do you <laughs> attack them? Um, people who uh, purport to be normal, who, who glory in their own normality. On an afternoon like this, when the hippos feel like a bit of a rub down, one tends to find oneself at Chessington Zoo. And the first thing that struck me was a piece of nose putty thrown by a person of, I think, Aboriginal origin. <laughs> the first thing that really grabbed my attention was this sign here, it's fun to be thirsty, which suggests all kinds of things. Perhaps it's comic to be decapitated, or it's jolly to have your leg off, or it's lots of laughs, a lobotomy. In Monkey Walk, there is much to surprise. 
I was reminded of my first offence against society by a friendly gibbon. I was arrested by one PC gibbon who I suggested might be the long arm of the law. I lost. But now public opinion. Do you think that animals should wear trousers? As a matter of principle, yes, I think all animals should be clothed. Like uh, piano legs as well. Yeah? Yeah. When I asked people this at the London Zoo, a lot of them said that they could, that they thought the idea of them wearing animals was, was immoral, but it would be all right if they walked in trenches. <laughs> well, yes, but imagine the depth of trench necessary for a giraffe. Might seem a daft question, but in London Zoo, on my way into the reptile house, I noticed a great crowd before the old monkey cages ogling the gorilla and the orangs. Three quarters of an hour later, when I emerged dripping and triumphant, I was astonished to see the same crowd. So, armed with a tape recorder and armoured with a heavy, Hello, I'm from the BBC, I asked if animals should wear trousers. 70% said yes, and one lady suggested that female monkeys might wear tutus, and she was serious. Who are the watchers, and who are the watched? I mean, why, do, why don't hippos wear hats? Now, this is the thing that Gérard de Naval uh, thought about very deeply. In fact, he used to toss his hat to hippos whilst passing through the Parisian zoos because hippos don't have the opportunity of wearing hats. This is most disturbing. Animals that require little or no trousers are turtles. And here at home, I have several species in this tank, I've got a little beast called the stink pot and a baby one, and also some red-eared sliders. Now, the stink pot, Stenothrus odoratus, is so called because it's said, when enraged, to give off a fearsome stench. But despite all my taunts over the years that I've had it, it's never so much as thumbed its snout at me, let alone give a <coughs> What it did do, though, was lay an egg. And this is quite an achievement, because London Zoo haven't managed as yet to rear any turtles. And here in their 1973 list of animals received and born in the menagerie, you can pop through and see that there's been a few Barbary sheep, uh, quite a lot of zebra finches, and the odd Malayan pit viper or two. But when you get to the turtle section, you find nothing at all. Last year, or rather the year before last, they did manage a few skinks. To clean these out, I have a sink at the back here, and that has a pipe running all the way along the wall and out into the front garden, and Harry Lyon crouches at the end there sometimes. <laughs> to clean them out, I insert the end of this plastic tube. Oh, by the way, while you're washing, why not have a glass of Chateau Tilbury at river temperature? It's absolutely delicious. I insert the end of this plastic pipe in here, suck jolly hard, and push it into the quick as I can, otherwise you get a mouthful of effluvia. Well, this serves a dual purpose, because by inserting a cornet mouthpiece in the end, I can summon up the boys' brigade. And from behind the magnificent 20th century Norman portal, you'll find the downstairs lavatory and me seated toying with my worms. I don't seem to have too many left, so I'll have to slip off and get some more. What I want is a vigorous bottom feeder. Um, um, not well, for eating vigorous bottoms, but I've got some. No, uh, no. Um, the best, well, the best thing is either a name and area, which is a sucking loach, or a placostomus, um, like that, or some form of corridor. Th this is for yes. Um, what what I've got is some uh, mud skippers, so it's brackish water. These are guppies, Delta Blues, I think. I'm stuck with two tankfuls of the vivaporous little swines at home. 
I got them to feed a piranha, now sadly deceased. This is piranha. I inadvertently cooked mine. I discovered he liked to nosh at a slightly higher temperature, so I installed an auxiliary heater in the tank, fed him, forgot about the heat, and come morning he was sunny side down and killed to a turn. Ironic, perhaps, but it wasn't too bad with a spot of sauce tartar. <coughs> I'll just pop off and see a chum of mine round the corner. But I first of all will describe what you're wearing. A very smart but very loud tweed jacket uh, in orange, mm. brown and yellow. A blue shirt, or well not shirt, sort of vest. Shirt hat. Shirt hat. Yes. And a most delicious little knitted hat. Mm. And you have with all this um, a sort of Moses beard. Now, who designed this ensemble? Well, I designed it. Uh, it's very I, fetching. It is, mm. isn't it engaging? This is um, quite an historic place, really. I mean, these oh. buildings are 1840, Regency buildings. How long have you lived here? Uh, 56 years. A grief. What was it like here? Well, very, very nice. But what kind of transport was in the street? Oh, horses. Horses? Yes, I've got many horses come through here. Or people, uh, I mean, riding or pulling, or well, they they had barrows and hmm. and the street organs used to come round and all that sort of thing. Well, like. Muffin men. That's yes, what... muffin men. Really? Yes. Well, yeah. An organ grinders and monkeys. Yes. And the barrows come round with the roundabouts on. Huh. So we enjoyed our childhood down here. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. Very bye nice bye. to have met you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Behind the unassuming facade of this Georgian terrace, I've come to see a friend of mine, Michael Lynch, who makes hurdy-gurdies, virginals, thank you, dear boy, um, wooden trumpets and duck-shaped ukuleles. That's why I'm here. I'm, here to pick up my duck-shaped ukulele. I'm hoping that it's finished. Mm. Uh, is it? Just about, just about. Weekdays, Mike teaches ceramics in Chelsea. However, when he isn't working, his passion is making medieval instruments, lutes, dulcimers, hurdy-gurdies, even virginals, on which, as you can hear, he makes an impossible row. He does make a very passable beer, though. to criticise his playing. Hear my effort on the wooden trumpet and then let musicianship crouch for employment. Uh, what about the pop scene today? Do you find them rather dull or exciting, the tricks they get up to? You seem to be much more original than the sort of things that uh, uh, one sees on the television nowadays. Um, I think it's, I, I, I think it is to a formula, mm. if you, if you... They're all predictable. Hmm. Yes. I really didn't mean to be quite that brutal and bonzo dogmatic, and I don't think Radio 1 would be quite as wonderful if it sounded like this. Mark you, groovers and poopers, if I put it out through a synthesizer, send it at 5,000 watts with a bit of bass and bop bop shiwari, sequins optional, well... Hello. This is my workshop, and this is an Edwardian parlour instrument called the phonofiddle or strovile. In the hands of an accomplished performer such as myself, you can hear that it has a almost mellifluous voice-like quality. Very exciting. Part of the reason I went to see Michael Lynch last Wednesday 
get down nostril, was to pick up this. It's a ukulele in the shape of a flying duck. I haven't yet painted it. It's just got the primer down there. I can't play you any of that because the strings are still stretching. It sounds dreadful. I was trying to get one in the shape of a flying Peter Scott, but unfortunately that proved too difficult to make. Good idea, though. Another interesting instrument here. I don't know what this is called, but it's got priapic overtones and sounds divine. Sends a shiver down the spine, doesn't it? There are a few other things I think you may find of interest in the room. I got this last year. Lady had obviously seen my name in the Radio Times and she wrote, Dear Madam, could you please let me have a signed photo of you as I collect them of famous people? Yours truly, Mrs L. Scott. I've got quite a lot of brochures and extraordinary stuff from the Trinidad and Tobago Express, which I might read to you later, and also some catalogues of tattooing and scalification, and also a mutilated boy, not a real one. There's a picture of my dad in drag. There's a picture of Patrick Moore. There's a picture of Liberace. I can feel the rhythm coursing through me. I think I better... In fact, I'm going to record tomorrow. It's now the end of the week, and I'm off to Oxford. At Paddington Station with my chums, a crate of brown ale, talking drums, great hosts on the platform there to wave and breathe in Brunel's aftershave. Many tongues heard, Greek, French and Persian, loud O's and R's and ooh la la's for this oldie English diversion. I suppose this is our national costume. It's jolly anyway, and jollity should be encouraged, perhaps given a grant. Two things in life I consider most important, making love and making people laugh. If you can combine both, you're onto a good thing, or else you're rather bad at it. going down to record two songs. This one we're rehearsing is called La Conga. The instrumentation is a little unusual. Giant thumb piano, talking drum and cabasa. There's a cabasa, that's Irish Derrick with one. It's a large gourd covered with a beaded hairnet. Later on we'll add African log, the cacophone, which is a cluster of car horns, organ and trumpet. Close your eyes and you're almost certainly drunk as a skunk. So to the grounds of the manor. Once a stately home, now a homely 16-track recording studio. Built around 1400 as a hunting lodge for Henry II, it's mentioned in the Doomsday Book. It's rather expensive as studios go, but you get a fine brass bed to sleep in, food and daily massage by a heavily muscled bearded laundress, a great hound to run with. Go. And a canal with an enchanting boozer dreaming beside it. Boom, 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 do -do. Ba -do. Ba -do I look back on all these years I've lived 
as plain as day that I've had more than most. Tell me about your new album. Is it, is it going to be very different to the doodah? It's better musically. Um, it's probably ruder uh, in both senses. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone under 48. Well, I qualify. <laughs> <laughs> the people wait. An old man comes. He lives a home to his mouth. This row is called Baba Tunde, which I concocted with my friend Gaspar Lawa. How utterly tranquil it is here. Here I'm trying with these long and skillful casts to ensnare a barrel of scrumpy. Down there you can see Vincent van Gogh, or at least a part of him. Yes, I've got one on the line now. And it's good to feel the old robbed thrusting and surging and quivering between the hands again. I'm bringing it in. Yes, there it is. Half a water rat. And you'd be surprised that these things contain almost as much protein as a bag of peanuts or indeed a telegraph pole. But I'm going to throw this back again because I'm after something. Get off. There's big fat bumps on guitar, freshly arrived from Cambridge. Behind him, Derek bonking and Mongazy blowing. I don't know whether this is going to be the A or the B side. They'll probably put it on the edge. What inspires you to do this? I, I, I think it's probably toads. Probably what? Toads. Toads? Toads. What, what way toads? Well, I mean, imagine uh, those thousand eyes looking at you, glaring through a lake. Suddenly one is encompassed by this whole umbrella mm. of diaphanous nostril. <laughs> like a lot of hippos looking at you. I see the vindaloo still there. I've tried everything to get that out, but I'm not going back to my old powder. Awful stench. There have been armadillos or rhinos in here or something. Say no to rhinos with rhino. Should have got rid of them. Oh, you horizontal Heracles with sleep stuck eyes and face agape. How bliss. Mm. I think I'll join you and dream of scaly things and value added Turks. Things to do with paper clips. Mm. The effortless stump remover. Rat juggling. Mm. Good night. I have enjoyed watching you. Why well, you're glamorous. Mm. No peeping. Mm. Sing. Don't 
Bye.